I'm delighted to invite Martin Leeming to join us as well as uh, Managing Director from the company TrackRap, a small company, uh, a machine builder who have used you know, the virtual design of the machine, the automation of the machine, and are now exploring uh, some of the cloud-based technologies to think about a servitized business model as well. But a small company, we'll be looking forward, delighted to hear from you, Martin, your, your digitalization journey. Thank you. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, it's, uh, that's, that's me, Martin Leeming, CEO of TrackRap. Um, I first came across this idea when I was a director at, at ASDA, and um, I was given a project uh, by this then CEO to basically the idea was if you can get them from the product from the source to the shelf cheaper than anybody else, and you can buy it cheaper than anybody else through Walmart, then you'll win. It was, it was quite a big project, and the bit I got was getting stuff from the source to the shelf cheaper than anybody else. So... I came across this concept and what we're about as a business is getting product from the source to the shelf cheaper than everybody else. Uh, we, work for the, uh, we work for food manufacturers designing and putting in packaging machinery for, for them to service the major supermarkets. Think of this as a case study. Um, we're on a journey of discovery. Um, we're at the beginning of that journey or, or somewhere along, somewhere on the line where we are exactly, we won't know, but we know we're going in the right direction. I'm not pretending to have the answers today. Uh, I'm not sure anybody really does have the answers, uh, but the opportunities uh, you know, are almost too big to contemplate and uh, you have to keep your, your mind open to where you're going to go next. Four key things for me today. It is about Industry 4.0. We specifically set these out as objectives along the way because there were things we kind of knew about. We knew about them from the old way of doing stuff, if you like. So uh, we knew there were massive advantages for us to be able to improve these areas. Uh, and we set ourselves uh, these as, as kind of objectives to, so that we could actually measure along the way where we were with our digital journey and to make sure that it was delivering uh, some results to us. What we set out to achieve, well, you know, we've talked about, about productivity today and um, uh, the food industry is no different. Uh, as you probably know, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, work uh, going on in the food industry to make that more productive and uh, there are certain challenges uh, facing us there. I have to say at this stage that uh, end of line retail or retail ready packaging is the, really the arse end of the food manufacturing business, I'm afraid to say. Uh, it's not the sexy packaging stuff. It's not the products you see in the, uh, on your shelf or in the cupboard uh, at home. It's, uh, it's not the stuff that the fluffy marketeers get excited about. Sorry, marketeers, but I am actually a big fan. Um, it's the, it, but it is a fundamental building block of the supply chain. Therefore, thinking about things in a different way, doing things differently, making things better has got to help. There has been no innovation in this area, by the way, since the, since the 70s, really. And, and most end-of-line production facilities in the food manufacturers have a box taper or a, or a shrink tunnel uh, on the end of them. So... When we were looking at this, you know, to give you an idea, those are the 10 things that the FDF, the Food and Drink Federation, which has 7,000 food manufacturers in it, those were the areas that we thought we could impact by, through, through this program. So sustainability, digital smart energy uh, consumption, uh, mass customization and, and packaging innovation. So again, there's a good context for this and actually it's entirely consistent with the digital journey we're on. We're just trying to deliver this stuff because we know if we deliver this stuff, we can, we can make money. One of the most difficult things to, uh, to wrap, funnily enough, is, uh, is aerosols. And uh, we, we, had a, we developed, a, we had, before, before we went on this digital journey, we had an analog, or I call it an analog machine, really, which could wrap big, heavy products. It was, uh, they were very stable. They were easy to wrap, relatively speaking. But the machine was kind of just really a, a PLC and uh, lots of uh, analog drives didn't really speak to each other. If something went wrong somewhere else, the other bit just carried on regardless. Uh, didn't go wrong that often which was quite handy. But when it came to doing things which was uh, unstable and difficult to manage, it really wasn't where we needed to be. So we knew we had to do something different. Um, 
The aerosols in themselves are, are tricky because they're very narrow diameter, if you can imagine that, because they've got to contain pressures and they're very tall as well. And they're often packed in four by three format, so they can often nest when you, when you try and wrap them. Shrink wrap kind of draws them in two directions, but while we're on the subject of shrink wrap, nobody really wants to put their aerosols through a heat tunnel and there is a safety issue attached to that. So whilst there's always a, a reason for using our technology, we have to get it right in order to do this. It's much more complicated uh, the process than we thought, and I think the digitalization journey was the only way we were going to solve this problem uh, along the way. Could we do it ourselves? Absolutely not. We realized that right from the beginning. We were using Siemens kit on our, uh, uh, on our analog machine, mainly around the PLC. So we went to, uh, to Siemens, and funnily enough, long story short, but Adam, who I sat next to this morning, he, uh, he was the person that we, we were referred to in Siemens to say, how are we going to solve this problem? And it, it, was, it was Adam that introduced us. He felt that the MTC was the right place to solve this problem. We then gain a, gained a grant with Innovate UK. And in, on our own, we, we're 16 people, as I said before. Uh, our engineering team here have been uh, fantastic. Richard is here. I think uh, Alan's here and Paul. Uh, they've worked tirelessly on this. And um, you know, on, on this journey, uh, we couldn't do it on our own. So. We, we came up with the consortium, which was the MTC. Uh, we uh, had um, Bradford University, because actually the film that we use, we had to know everything about that film, the properties, in order to build this model. Uh, and uh, DHL, who were our live customer, who have a lot of business in this area, because they're the biggest co-packer in the UK, and they're our customer for the, f for the, for the machine at the end of the day. So, uh, what did we do, really? Uh, how did it go? Quick video for you here, which you have uh, recently shot in the blue inside. Okay, so I'll just take you very quickly uh, through some of the key uh, parts that you probably picked up there. The starting point for this journey was the kinematics, funnily enough, something I hadn't even heard of before, by the way. Um, in our case, we had to really understand that bit of the process which gave instability in our machine. Lots of the bits we understand already and you can, you can get there with the traditional stuff and don't throw that out the window because it works, you know, and if it's, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But this part of the, the process, the actual wrapping of, the, uh, of this unstable product, we, we didn't know how to do it. Traditionally, you might have built a, built a model, maybe a, a physical model, and then just trial and error it, really, until you either got it right or, or just gave up at the end of the day. Uh, that's not really going to be suitable. So uh, it, th this is about maths and physics, simple as that. It isn't about... Uh, if it's, it's bizarre, really, but um, you know, in this model is, is gravity, friction of the product on the conveyor, the way the film stretches, the physical properties of the film itself, the forces being applied, the different speeds, etc. They are part of a mathematical model, which is called kinematics. It's a moving model, if you like. It's a dynamic model. Uh, we don't have the skills to do that, unfortunately. You need a big computer. Luckily, the MTC have the skills, and they've got a very big engineering toolbox, which uh, is, is some of that. Uh, some of that uh, kit that, that enables it to happen, such as Siemens uh, me uh, Mechatronics, which is, which is where they produced all this stuff, and the, uh, and the kinematic model. So this, this actually is, is, a, is, a, is actually the, the output from that. There's a huge amount of computing power in this because it's a very complicated uh, model. Um, the guys down at the MT, D, MDC, that they, they don't just work digitally, they think digitally, uh, they, they actually talk digitally. I'm told that 11100110 in binary means hello, apparently. Um, I didn't ask what can I, have, can I have a cup of tea means because uh, it would have taken too long. But once you have the kinematics, you know, you know the forces that are involved in doing this and that point of stability. That's the basic building block for the digital twin, which is the next stage of the process. Before we did that, <laughs> by, by popular demand is my digital twin. Um, I was with Simon at the uh, Institute of Mechanical Engineers about a year ago before we were very far down this journey. I thought, we haven't got a digital twin, so I'd better build one quickly. Uh, and there's my digital twin. He, um, he's a good-looking fella. I'm sure you'll all agree. Uh, he can do everything uh, that I want, want to be able to do, funnily enough, but can't. He can even dance. I created him last year, as I said, and he, ha he hasn't aged at all, unlike me, who's merely his physical twin and degrading fast, I might tell you. Anyway, I think that's, the, uh, I think that's the enough, of, uh, enough of him. Well, thank you. 
Here's the real digital twin. So it looks pretty much like uh, stuff that we used to do uh, using in Inventor and then uh, mecha mechanizing it. But actually, that is actually that is actually a working model. It, it works. That it actually happens. And and it's quite a big step to say you know it's made up of lots of digital twins. So all the Siemens kit on it has digital twins as well. So you're not on your own. The bit we have to specialize in is that critical bit in the wrapping process that's really the the essence of our digital twin but all the bits in there are available to to, to make up the whole machine as well if we need to if we need to do that um, although at, at this stage we we've we've kind of got there in two in, in a bit of the old-fashioned way and the new way this is this is actually a digital twin that works and we, we use our current program as part of that process, but it's not beyond you to know that, that, that actually the program could be generated from this digital twin, so it's almost reverse way. Once you've got that kinematics, then you've got the digital twin. You're not far off being able to, uh, to then create the basic program that you need to run it, which at the moment takes a huge amount of time. Um, where are we going? Oh, sorry. Where are we? Where are we going? How will this affect machine development? Well, we're at this stage at the moment. We're uh, uh, the old ways at the top way there. Tr try everything, test everything, build a prototype. I can guarantee you when you build the prototype, it won't work. There'll be a lot of, but hopefully you've got close enough to be able to create your final build. The digital twin is that final build. It is, work it is right, it works. It, it, there's no question about it. I don't need to build a physical twin if I don't want to, but being as I want to sell something, I'm going to have to. Uh, but I'm building a, a final machine, which is we're, we're currently in the build process now. It will work. It will look exactly like that, and it and, and it will work. So the digital twin is actually it, it is a is a, an entity that we know is going to work. Where before we, we we never had that ability to do that. So we said we were going to what we what we're looking to say. We, we said we were looking at you know, reducing the time and cost of development, and we reckon the time to market is going to be down by about forty percent, and the development cost will be down by about thirty percent. So I'll come back and guarantee I'll tell you that because, as I say, we're in the build program at the moment, and at the end of it, we'll have the stats, and I'll let you know how we get on. What else are we going to be able to do? So. This is, this is the, the other big bit, because I think Brian mentioned we have a servitization model. We don't sell machines, we sell what comes off the end of it, if that makes sense. We pay for outcomes. Therefore, the uptime performance of the machine is absolutely critical. Uh, and we know on this journey, again, another part of our digital journey is that already uh, perform somatic performance mo monitors, energy managers, notifiers, these are apps that already exist and we can plug straight into using the mind sphere or the internet of things and pull data straight down into these pre-prepared apps to do that. We, the stage we're at at the moment, it, or where we're going, is to have a full dashboard that allows us to monitor our machines remotely on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, imagine if we can intervene early and keep the uptime performance going, then we don't get called out. And because we own our machines, uh, then if we get called out, it costs an awful lot of money. So digitalization is allowing us to change the model about how we service, repair, maintain these machines while they're out in the field. What we've actually got at the moment is our first stab at that. This is real, so this is uh, actually where we are. It doesn't look quite as smart as the, as the apps at the moment, but we're starting to tailor it towards our own uh, our own requirements, which is easy, very easy to do. Once you've got the digital data, once you've got the, the stuff going up to the mind sphere, uh, then you've got the opportunity to create anything. And sensors is obviously going to be a big part in this. You know, for instance, you know, if uh, we see a, a motor running hot, you know, is it drawing more power? That's going to signal to uh, to us that there's uh, some intervention required in some way, either either digitally or by um, or by somebody going out there at the last call. What's next for our digital twin? Well, you know, it's not beyond uh, it's not beyond us to picture the next stage of our journey, and that our digital twin, which is perfect in every way, as we've already found out from mine, um, is it sits in the mind sphere and it con constantly monitors our physical twin, which is on the ground. Our physical twin, of course, is wearing out all the time. It's being used. It's not perfect anymore, but any dis differences between our physical twin and our and our, and our digital twin will be picked up immediately. And again, we can either get in there uh, um, 
Um, we can either get in there digitally or we can get in there by physical intervention. But again, that completely changes the model about how we look after our machines on the ground and makes our servitization model work. What are we forecasting on this? We've already got some experience of this, but we reckon in terms of call-outs and downtime, we're targeting a 53% reduction in call-outs and a 72% reduction in, in, in downtime. I should say that our machines are extremely reliable. I think we're at something like two, 290 days mean time between failure at the moment. So that, you know, to be able to improve on that but in, in this way is, is obviously going to be a big difference to us uh, both uh, and, and to our customers. So where next? Con connectivity and virtually, virtual commissioning. Again, our digital twin can be linked up with, and this is, again is, is, is the way that the end of line production is going in, in, in the supermarkets. We can link these things together very, very easily. And we can create a production line that can save a, an awful lot of money for food manufacturers. I reckon that th this simple plug and play production line will have the lowest um, um, people cost, it'll have the lowest energy usage and it'll have the least material usage of any production line, food production line in the world. Uh, and I think in the UK alone, there's probably 3,600 production lines which would instantly benefit from, from that. So what is the, uh, what is the um, uh, new business model? We call it uh, paper app. So basically it's paper outcomes. We guarantee to the customer that their packaging cost will be lower than anybody else. They don't have to look after the machine themselves. They don't have to pay any capex up front. That's in the cost of the, uh, uh, the pence per case that we charge them, or pence per wrap as we, as we call it. It's based on the amount of film that they use. We're also very fortunate that we're able to use Siemens Financial Service to help us with our cash flow in that, in that they can then uh, give us the cash up front in order for us to continue investing in building new machines. So finally, to say we're not, you know, we're not Rolls-Royce, uh, but we are taking a long-term view, and I think that's a critical uh, message. We've not been afraid to, to go into the unknown uh, and be fully committed in doing it, but by investing in technology. And above all, collaboration with people like, the, with people like Siemens, the MTC, Knowledge Transfer Network, academic centers of excellence like Bradford Uni, even small SMEs like us can get on the digital bandwagon. We, as we said this morning, we're not so much making it up as we're going along, but we are going along as we make it up. So thank you very much.